Good evening. How are you? I can see another full room today. That is good. I always like to see the room uh, packed out. And I'm very grateful that you have been coming to see us for the last few months and have really packed out that room all the time. So thank you very much for our for coming to our exciting event on transatlantic relations from crisis to crisis, transatlantic relations from the 1980s to the very present. Uh, let me remind you, uh, please, to sign our mailing list. If you haven't been on our uh, mailing list already, I will put you onto my electronic uh, database and then we'll inform you accordingly when we have new events coming up. We also, as you know, have a YouTube channel, youtube.com uh, slash UNC. We, we videotape all our events and you can there watch them on our YouTube channel all the time, so to speak. And some people even do so. That's great. <laughs> we also have a, a, a website, krasnoevents.com. And if you forget when the next event is, just check that website. There is a program and uh, events are being listed on that uh, website, krasnoevents.com. I'm Klaus Lauris and I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina uh, at Chapel Hill. Today, as I said, we have a very exciting event on transatlantic relations, on from crisis to crisis. But actually, when you think about transatlantic relations, if you go back to the 1960s and 1970s, certainly the 1980s, transatlantic relations have always been in crisis. So the question is, what is new? What are the continuing factors in that crisis situation, which we call the transatlantic relationship, and what has changed over time? And what is new when we think of uh, Donald Trump and his relationship to NATO or his relationship to the European Union? We have three experts today who help us to discuss these questions and to hopefully uh, give us some insights what to do in order to overcome uh, the crisis in transatlantic relations. There is um, Susie Corbon. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University. She got her PhD at the University of Toronto and she's an expert and she works on the Atlantic Alliance and nuclear weapons. And then we have Matthias Häusler. Matthias Häusler is from the University of Regensburg. He did his PhD at Cambridge University in the UK. And he has just published a book on Helmut Schmidt and British-German relations. It has just come out, but it is so new that we couldn't have a copy here. Apparently, it has already become a bestseller almost in Europe, but it hasn't quite got to the United States. We are expecting copies next week. But the, uh, the flyer, I think, is out. And then, uh, last but not least, we have Stefan Keeningen. Uh, Stefan is a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University at the School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C. And he has recently published two books, Dynamic Detente, The United States and Europe, 1964 to 1975. And paperback copies of that book are actually outside for purchase. And I'm sure Stefan will be happy to sign it if you're interested in, uh, in buying the book. And he has recently also published another book, which deals with the diplomacy of detente, security policy from Helmut Schmidt to George Schultz. And that uh, is also so fresh that we haven't got a copy here, but flyers are there. Um, before we open the event for today, I would like to make the announcement that we have another event coming up, a special event on the 2nd of April, already next Tuesday. Flyers have been distributed already here in this room. And that is an event on security, uh, on cyber security and cyber warfare. The rise of cyber warfare the new frontier of national defense. And we have an expert from the FBI, we have an expert from the National Security Agency, and an expert from the RAND Corporation, as well as an expert from UNC. So that promises to be a highly interesting event. And my senior assistant here, Maya Kapoor, she has, she's the one who took the lead on organizing this event, and she and I will try to moderate our exports next week. So I hope you will come back on Tuesday. But for the time being, we deal with transatlantic relations and uh, what is wrong, what has gone wrong in transatlantic relations since the 1980s. 
and Stefan Kieninger in a minute will actually set the scene and give us the overall picture of that development from the 1980s to the present. Then um, Matthias Häusler will talk about British-German relations and the transatlantic scene in a wider context. And then uh, Susie Colborn will talk about the, Ru the Russian dimension and the Russian aspect of that uh, relationship. Let's start with uh, Stefan. They will each talk for 10 to 15 minutes max, and then we will go to the stage, have a bit of a discussion, and then open it up to questions and answers uh, from our engaged audience, as I always happen to say. So let's start with St Stefan Kieninger. <laughs> Good evening, um, everybody. It's a uh, great pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you so much, Klaus Larus, for the very kind invitation. Uh, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, let's go straight to the substance. Uh, our talk um, is about transatlantic relations from the 1980s to the present. Uh, my task is to uh, set the stage and I will dwell on NATO's role and its relevance in the Cold War um, and beyond. So back in the 1980s, NATO faced a great amount of transatlantic upheaval. At the same time, NATO had a unique ability to adapt itself in times of crisis. And in my presentation, I will look into both elements, both the crisis and uh, NATO's ability to adapt itself. And actually, when we talk about NATO's... I think this is better. <laughs> actually, when we talk about NATO's um, adaptability, we should mention the Hamel Report of 1967, uh, which had a crucial dimension. It gave NATO much more of a political role beyond deterrence, and moreover, it endowed NATO with a political mandate for detente uh, policies back at that time. And it gave the West Europeans a crucial political role in the entire detente process in Europe. And in the second half of the 1970s, NATO adapted again, reacting to the Soviet buildup in SS-20 missiles, which led to NATO's dual track decision of 1979. And that decision was riddled with uh, serious debates over NATO's uh, credibility and uh, over NATO's purpose in general. And NATO found the right response to the Euro missile crisis. For the first time, NATO as a whole took a nuclear procurement decision, and that reflected NATO's internal democratization and the weight that was being placed on uh, the consultations within uh, the alliance on a transatlantic uh, level. Now let's come to the crisis elements, and there were many crises in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and what was the reason for, for, for the uh, multitude of crises back then in the late 1970s, early 1980s? I would say um, it was several um, unilateral American moves without prior uh, consultation in NATO back at that time. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, think about Jimmy Carter's move to drop the neutron bomb in April, in April 1978. It was a disaster. It wrecked his uh, relations with the Europeans and particularly his relations with uh, Germany's Chancellor Helmut Schmidt. The same goes for Carter's unilateral sanctions after the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. The same goes for his Olympic boycott in 1980. The same goes for Ronald Reagan's decision to lift the grain embargo in 1981 without prior consultation. The same goes for Reagan's unilateral decision uh, to have sanctions against the construction of a uh, gas pipeline, natural gas pipeline for the transport of natural gas from the Soviet Union to Western Europe. And the same goes um, uh, um, also to, to, to his decision to uh, renew these sanctions in 1982. So what had happened? Why did Carter and Reagan embark on these unilateral moves? I think there was a complete uh, change in domestic mood in the United States back at that time. In January 1980, there was a crisis meeting in Helmut Schmidt's chancellery, and I, I quote from the crisis meeting, Helmut Schmidt said in, in January 1980, he observed, I quote, the guilt feelings in the aftermath of Vietnam and Watergate had vanished. One had to take care and be cautious not to act blindly. End quote. That was in January 1980. And what happened then? The West Europeans back at that time refused to follow uh, Carter's and Reagan's sanctions and their lead uh, because the West European policymakers were, were, were keen to, um, to keep the taunt alive, to keep the economic dimension alive, to keep East-West trade alive, natural gas trade with the Soviet Union. Um, why? Think of divided Germany. The West, German, 
West Germans perceived trade um, as, a, as a political instrument. It was much more than a mere matter of, of trade, actually, uh, because the West Germans used it as a means to buy Germans out from Eastern Europe, ethnic Germans from Poland, from Romania, from elsewhere. It was very important for German policymakers, from Willy Brandt to Helmut Schmidt to Helmut Kohl. And, and Ostpolitik was a means to perforate the Iron Curtain, and the Germans would suffer most if this policy went down a drain. However, Carter and Reagan saw the expansion of West European <coughs> gas trade with the Soviet Union with concern. Uh, they feared it would aggravate Western Europeans' dependence on Soviet gas, and they believed that trade led to increased political vulnerabilities, inhibiting the capability of West Europeans uh, to confront the Soviet Union over the Euro missiles. So the crisis was there for four years, from 78 to 82, and then George Schultz was appointed to, uh, as, as Ronald Reagan Secretary of State, and finally Schultz was able to find the solution to all of these transatlantic problems that had been occurring. And um, what Schultz did he, uh, was he managed to broker a transatlantic compromise. So Schultz's objective was to move from the pipeline to the broader issues of East-West economic relations. And Schultz um, uh, thought that there would be a trade of the United States would withdraw from its sanctions and the Europeans would adhere to a strengthened trade and credit regime. And actually Schultz's approach worked. He managed to use NATO's crisis as an opportunity and he got a commitment by NATO to work out an economic strategy to complement the military strategy and the strategy on values which NATO already had. That was in 1982. And I think um, it was decisive that Schulz uh, emphasized the validity of, of NATO's dual track approach. There was always deterrence and at the same time some sort of detente and dialogue with the, with the Soviet Union and, and, and the Europeans doubted that this was still the American policy and, and, and Schulz uh, maintained that this was still true and that was the, the condition, precondition also, I would say, for the deployment of Pershing and cruise missiles in 1983 to create that, that Pershing moment in 1983. So in a nutshell, the Schultz approach towards the Soviet Union was confront where you have to, negotiate where you can. Confront where you have to, negotiate where you can. Confront but maintain dialogue don't run away from the bargaining table. And that was very, very crucial because the Soviets ran away from the bargaining table, right? In 1983, NATO, went, NATO stayed there at the bargaining table, right? So it was the Soviets who, who ran away and that was, was a crucial moment for, uh, yeah, to improve NATO's credibility, to improve its, its, its solidarity in, in times of, um, of crisis. And, um, and let me also quote, I think it's a nice quote, let me quote from an interview that George Schulz and James Goodby conducted for the Foreign Service Journal back in 2016, also on this um, interconnection between uh, detente and, or deterrence and detente. Schulz said, if you go to a negotiation and you don't have any strength, you are going to get your head handed to you. On the other hand, the willingness to negotiate builds strength because you are using it for a constructive purpose. If it is strength with no objective to be gained, it loses its meaning. So I think they go together. These are not alternative ways of going about things." End quote. And this was Schulz's approach and it worked throughout the 1980s and it got NATO out of the, of the Euro missile uh, crisis and he played a tremendous uh, role in it, I would say. So the Reagan administration was ready to negotiate and there was an emergence of a cooperative security policy between Reagan and Gorbachev <coughs> and, um, and and the demise of the Soviet Union came through patient negotiations. So there was an emergence of a new cooperative security order and today we still live with the security system, with the institutions that Reagan and Gorbachev um, uh, uh, had, had brought about. Think of the INF treaty, think of the strategic arms uh, um, negotiations back at that time, and, um, and, and this security framework is very much in, in, in jeopardy uh, today. And I think this downward, Reagan and, and, and Gorbachev managed to create an, an, an upward spiral of trust 
And today's downward spiral can only uh, be stopped if, if, if we, like NATO and, 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 and Russia, have yeah, some, some sort of new positive experiences with, which, uh, with each other, which is very, very difficult at, um, at the time. So the transatlantic partnership um, is still there. NATO was able to overcome its, its crisis in the 1980s, and NATO expanded in the, in the early 1990s. And, uh, and NATO has demonstrated an impressive ability to adapt to the changing uh, political circumstances. Uh, after the fall of the wall, after Germany's uh, unification, NATO opened itself up and uh, uh, Hungary and Poland and the Czech Republic became the first former Warsaw Pact states to become members of NATO in 1999. And um, a couple of weeks ago I interviewed Germany's foreign, uh, former defense minister Volker Rühe. He played an instrumental role in NATO's uh, opening towards um, Eastern Europe back in the 1990s. And he understood that the countries of Eastern Europe, that Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia and others, they wanted the same kind of security as Germany and as France and as Belgium and the Netherlands and all the other West European countries. And they understood that they could only get this kind of security in NATO, right? So if, if, if NATO had not welcomed them, they would have established some sort of, a, of, of their own security organization between NATO and Russia. And that would have been very dangerous back at that time. It could have led uh, into more crisis, into instability, and so forth. And, 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 and I think back in the 1990s, this was, was, a, was a very, um, a very um, smart idea to, to, uh, to, um, to expand NATO and um, to, to, to guarantee uh, these uh, former Warsaw Pact countries a new sense of, of security. So I would say, and, and Volker Rühe also said that, that if NATO had not opened up, there would have been a danger for the alliance to break apart back in the 1990s. And also, important, I think that without NATO's opening, the European Union would not have survived as an institution because the European Union is not able to provide that sort of hard security that NATO is able to provide um, for the Eastern European countries. And um, to conclude my remarks, um, uh, I have to criticize, I'm German, I have to criticize my own government uh, because it is, it is very easy for us uh, Germans to criticize the Trump administration, but uh, Germany's policy is also undermining NATO because we are not uh, doing enough for our uh, defense and we uh, are not committed to contributing 2% uh, of our gross domestic uh, product to defense. Actually, we are contributing one point to 5%, a little more than half, and that is not enough. And, and actually, it's a, it's a shame because it's, it, it undermines the very foundation of NATO. And uh, yeah, so this is, this is a very, very important uh, point. There was today an, uh, an, an article in the Wall Street Journal. Um, maybe you have, you have read it, and, 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 and I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a good point because um, our policy in, in Germany is also undermining uh, NATO, and we let's hope again that NATO will be able to to adapt in times of crisis. I think in the past NATO has always demonstrated an an ability to adapt and to to um, and to use actually crisis as an opportunity. And uh, let's hope that this will also be the case in the future. And um, with this, I pass the microphone to who's who's next, Matthias. Matthias, yeah. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to try this, put, putting this here because I'm much smaller, so maybe this, this <laughs> may be all right. Okay, okay. Can, can you all hear me? This is good. It's, it's a stupid question because if you couldn't, you couldn't hear it. But um, anyway, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me, uh, for, for having me here. It's my first time uh, in uh, Chapel Hill. Um, Klaus asked me to talk about uh, the British perspective on the transatlantic relationship particularly, of course, in the current context of, of Brexit. Because Brexit raises questions not only about Britain's relationship with Europe, but also questions about 
Britain's role in the wider world? How is Britain going to position itself um, after Brexit? Is it going to carve itself a sort of new niche, a sort of kind of mega Singapore, as a sort of kind of free trade island? Uh, is it going to stay more closely aligned with the European Union and some sort of free trade area or some customs union? But also, some of the issues uh, Stefan hinted at, uh, will it stick with the Europeans in security and defense issues? Or will it try to do uh, something else? What will be the consequences of Brexit for European security? I mean, as of yesterday, Britain is already out of the common security and defense operations in Somalia. Um, so these are, have the potential to be quite burning issues quite soon. Um, at the same time, from a historian's perspective, there are of course not new uh, questions, as kind of Klaus hinted at in his introductions. Transatlantic relations have always come from crisis to crisis, and these issues about Britain's position have also been a part of the story since 1945. You should remember that in 1945, Britain was still a global power. It still had a global reach. Winston Churchill described it as the time uh, Britain as a country which stood at the center of three interlocking circles, the Anglo-American potentially special relationship, the Empire Commonwealth uh, as the second circle, and Europe as the third. And you know, Britain was the only country that was at, at the center of these kind of three interlocking uh, circle. The consequence was, of course, that as the kind of uh, Empire Commonwealth dimension diminished, as the kind of Anglo-American relationship became increasingly one-sided, that kind of the emphasis on Europe, the um, accuration of kind of EC membership in the 70s was sort of seen as a kind of abandonment of that kind of global British role to some extent. It was a question that had seemingly been resolved by membership in 73, um, but is now being reopened by uh, Brexit. But what I want to suggest today is that it actually reopened much earlier. I think Brexit is merely the combination of developments that started in the early to mid 80s, which brings us back to, of course, the overall uh, theme of this talk. And I think in the early, early 80s, they emerged attention. Attention between the re-emergence of the idea of Britain as a kind of extra-European nation in domestic politics and kind of British public discourse on the one hand, and the realities of Britain as a European power inextricably intertwined with its European partners on the other hand. I think Brexit uh, is, in a sense, the result of that tension between the kind of rediscovery of a non-European identity in domestic discourse and Britain's actual structural dependence on uh, Europe. Of course, one could take this further. Um, one could argue Britain has always been different to its European neighbours. You know, it's always been an island. Uh, it's a ten no invasion since 1066. Um, you know, the centuries-long peaceful evolution of British democracy, the role as a kind of global empire. That's, of course, something that the so-called historians for Britain have argued in the run-up of the Brexit referendum. There is maybe something in that. On the other hand, British history has always been intertwined with the history of its European neighbours through wars, through knowledge transfers, through kind of personal interchanges. Um, also on the empire point, I would advise caution, uh, because before the final wave of decolonization, um, having an empire was not a contradiction to being European. In fact, being an imperialist was something quite uniquely European at the time. So, uh, in a sense, the, the idea of kind of uh, an automatic link between the end of empire and an increase in kind of anti-European opposition to European integration, I think, is, is something that doesn't really hold. Um, other ex-empires, say France, have created quite success successfully a new European identity for themselves. Germany, after the Second World War, has managed to create this kind of new European identity. Britain has always been uneasy with, with that for, for several reasons. In Britain... European integration does not, did not solve the post-imperial, post-World War II identity question. It rather um, strengthened the, the identity crisis. And of course, that was then further strengthened by the very uneasy way uh, Britain went into the European community. It first didn't want to take part because of different political, economic <coughs> trading interests. It then decided to take part, but was vetoed twice uh, by the French. Then it joined in 1973. You know, it joined at the worst possible time, uh, economic energy crisis, 
It joined out of negative motivations, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, that sort of way. And it joined an institution that was not of their making with rules that were not to, to its liking. And so for Britain, Europe was not the answer. The, the, the parties remained divided, the public remained divided. Uh, nonetheless, Britain joined for pragmatic reasons, right? There was no other option. It was kind of grudging acceptance of post-imperial realities. But that, I think, is important because that was never really communicated to the public in that way. Like, you don't say to your public, so, we've run out of options, we have to join the European community, we don't really like it, but, you know, that, that's, we, we kind of have to do this. No, they were kind of, uh, were ideas of potential economic advantages, of kind of leading uh, Europe politically, and, and so on. And there's a certain, certain um, contrast. And I think in the, in, in the Thatcher years, the Thatcher years after 1979, that really, the tension between the public discourse and, and the political realities really comes, really breaks out. And I think it's partly because Thatcher tries to, to prop up uh, her domestic uh, support by sort of reinventing a new British uh, post-imperial or English identity, an identity that is based was based on a difference to Europe, Britain as a sort of extra-European power. You see that in the Falklands War. You see that in her increasing skepticism uh, towards further integration in the European Union, the famous Brugge speech in uh, 1988. You see it also in the public staging of the special relationship with, with Ronald Reagan. And so in a sense, in kind of the public presentation of the Thatcher government, that idea of Britain as a kind of at the center of Churchill's three circles, kind of re-emerges in the public presentation. But ironically, when you look at the hard policies of the Thatcher government, they're actually quite at odds with that image. You know, special relationship, always nice. Uh, Helmut Schmidt once said, it's so special, only one side knows it exists. But uh, <laughs> it's... Um, <clears throat> but even here, Reaganomics, right? Thatcher was very much in the early 80s on the side of, of the other European partners in terms of the effects of US debt and the dollar on uh, transatlantic trade. If you look at issues like the pipeline crisis, for example, or even Afghanistan or Poland, Thatcher is very much in substance, not in rhetoric, on the side of the Europeans. And also when you look at the creation of the European community single market, um, that is very much the market, you know, the removal of all barriers for internal trade. That is very much due to Thatcher's uh, neoliberal agenda in the European community, very much due to Thatcher's influence. So what we have under Thatcher is this emergence of the contrast between an you know, anti-European or extra-European rhetoric, public presentation, and the realities of the structural pressures, economic, political pressures, drawing Britain ever more closely to Europe. And I think what has happened is that this contrast has widened ever since then. The kind of the identity dimension, the public discourse kind of took a life of its own in political parties, creation of the United Kingdom Independence Party, in parts of the Conservative Party, which can of course be traced more directly to the origins of the Brexit referendum, and also in the wider uh, public discourse with uh, the press turning increasingly anti-European in the late 80s, early 90s, the Sun and the Murdoch. So you have this kind of Eurosceptic turn in a public discourse. And at the same time, as the structural pressures drawing Britain into Europe are uh, also increasing. You have the accelerating pace of integration in the 90s itself, where the European community morphs into the uh, so-called European Union we have now. There are also the changes of uh, geopolitics, the end of the Cold War. I mean, Britain actually had a great Cold War, you know, it kind of propped up its political influence, its military influence. That's no longer there. We have a world that is moving from a kind of bipolar world order to a multipolar world order where regional trading blocks like the European Union become ever more important. And of course, Britain itself has become a lot more interwoven with uh, European politics, sense of legislation, norms, regulations, you know, citizens' rights, and so on. So again, I think Brexit reveals a sort of dichotomy, a sort of kind of contradiction between rhetoric and and reality, which brings me to my conclusion about the uh, prospects for Brexit and the, the impact of the transatlantic um, relationship. Um, I think the current situation in British politics as we speak uh, shows that it's, it's, it's quite impossible to solve. You know, it's, it's very hard to unscramble an egg. Uh, Britain and the EU have, been, have become so interwoven that it's very hard to kind of try to separate the two again. And any kind of sort of halfway alternative is likely to be worse. 
It also shows, I think, what we're seeing now, that the idea of Britain as an extra European, potentially even a global power, is merely a rhetorical construct. It's, it's an illusion that's been used for domestic purposes. We see now that all the alternatives that were proposed by the Brexiteers in the referendum campaigns are all unlikely to work, or that they're actually worse than um, staying in the European Union in the first place, when we talk about the customs union, potential free trade area, um, etc. So maybe I think Brexit may ultimately, hopefully, finally lead to the realization of that gap between public rhetoric, kind of self-understanding as this kind of extra European power, and the reality of being very much a medium-sized uh, European power. But you know, there could be worse things in life. Um, and, but this is a German speaking. Um, in, I mean, in hard politics, I think this has been suggested, uh, has been accepted for some time, and Britain has actually played that role quite, quite successfully, but it hasn't really quite filtered through uh, in, in domestic politics. And maybe this might happen now with whatever, you know, uh, Westminster comes up with over the next couple of days. Maybe. What is then finally the impact on the transatlantic relationship? I think currently it's still very much in everybody's interest to, to separate these, these two areas. Britain has always been a champion of the transatlantic alliance. It has also been a champion of a strong European pillar in the transatlantic alliance. At the same time, of course, there remain very real sort of spillover um, dangers or effects of possibly unintended spillovers from Brexit into security politics. And, and the future here, I think, is very much dependent on where the European Union actually will be going uh, in, in the current climate. And thus far, as, as Stefan has said, you know, the economic integration has benefited very much from the transatlantic security umbrella, you know, the, the cover of NATO. You could focus on soft integration on economics. Um, if that sort of transatlantic security umbrella now is in, in danger or seems to be gone, will the European Union actually go on, develop a more independent role uh, to the US? Will it develop more autonomous defense capabilities, the talk of the European Union army, and so on? If, if that actually happens, the question is, will Britain take part in this? Um, my own prediction is that it's quite unlikely that the European Union will actually go down that path. There's still the capabilities expectations gap. But if, if it does, if the European Union does do that, Britain might again have to confront the, the realities of its, of its position. It could either join up with the other Europeans in such an effort, because that's where, you know, geography, politics, economics, trade factors kind of pointed towards, or it could come up with some new British role and a sort of kind of new alternative international global position or identity. Again, however, nobody quite seems to know how that alternative might actually look like. And I'm going to leave it at that. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here at UNC today. Um, and I'm going to round out what my two preceding speakers have talked about and focusing a little bit on Russia and the state of NATO's relations with Russia today. So 2019, as you well know, is a significant year for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, with a few big and meaningful anniversaries. Next month, NATO will celebrate 70 years since the signing of the Treaty of Washington. In November, it will be the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And not for the first time in the Alliance's 70-year history, we hear pundits bemoan a series of crises that are plaguing transatlantic relations. NATO is, we are told, once more in crisis, with reference to everything from Donald Trump and the president's reluctance to affirm Article 5, the collective security guarantee that lies at the heart of the Treaty of Washington, or Germany's refusal to spend more on defense. Just today, an op-ed appeared in the Wall Street Journal with the headline, NATO is dying, but don't blame Trump. The culprit, at least according to the author of the piece, Walter Russell Mead, is Berlin. With the German cabinet's recent decision to keep defense spending low, well under the 2% GDP threshold that the Allies have agreed to, Mead maintains that the decision signals the alliance's waning relevance for Berlin, long a firm champion of the transatlantic alliance's importance. 
Building off of what has already been said, I want to briefly sketch out some of the current challenges in transatlantic relations, those facing the Atlantic Alliance, and of course to put them in a little bit of historical context. I'll focus today on two issues, both of which are related to NATO's relationship with Russia, though there are plenty of others that we could talk about in the question and answer period. I want to talk first for a little bit about the challenges to the INF Treaty, and then I'll turn to discuss NATO's posture in Eastern Europe and how it has evolved since the end of the Cold War. The United States, as we know, has begun withdrawing from the INF Treaty, the historic 1987 agreement banning intermediate-range nuclear forces signed by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. The reasons for walking away from this agreement boil down to Russian violations. In December of 2018, the NATO allies collectively released a statement condemning recent Russian activities as the Russians had developed a new missile system known by the incredibly cumbersome alphanumeric code, the, N, or the 9M729. This, uh, the Western allies maintain, is a clear violation of the 1987 INF Treaty. At face value, then, it seems a little bit odd for me to talk about this as a point of transatlantic crisis. And it certainly signals a setback in NATO's relations with Russia, but if the NATO allies collectively agree and release public statements uh, condemning the Russian violations, that Russia has violated this decades-old agreement, where is the transatlantic rift? The United States' willingness to walk away from the treaty entirely, along with the Russian violations themselves, have triggered fears of another nuclear arms race taking place on the European continent. Jens Stoltenberg, who's currently NATO Secretary General, has publicly commented that there will be no additional missile deployments in Europe. But the idea still lingers as a potential response with the earlier agreement now in tatters. Moreover, the issue raises perennial questions in transatlantic relations about how best to provide for the defense of Europe, that core mission at the very heart of NATO's foundation and its purpose over the last seven decades. And it is, of course, an issue that lay at the heart of countless transatlantic crises over the years, including the problems that the INF Treaty had initially tried to solve in the late 1980s. And fears of another arms race, I think, reflect this past, as many remember with no small degree of trepidation NATO's 1979 decision to deploy the intermediate range nuclear forces to Western Europe, the Pershing IIs and ground launch cruise missiles uh, that were mentioned earlier, and the considerable public backlash that that decision engendered across the alliance. Hundreds of thousands of citizens took to the streets uh, from West Berlin to Vancouver to oppose those missiles. Now, concerns about how the Western allies can and should provide for the defense of Europe dovetail with a much larger problem facing the Atlantic Alliance since the early 1990s. It boils to one, down to one large and seemingly simple question. What was NATO's purpose after the Cold War? And as the contemporary corollary to this question, why do we still need the alliance going forward? Lord Ismay, who served as NATO's first Secretary General, and a quip sure to be familiar to some, remarked that the alliance's purpose was, quote, to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. How many of those functions actually remained once the Cold War was over? After the reunification of the two Germanys, who elected to remain within NATO after the Soviet Union broke apart, splintering into new countries. NATO transformed considerably in the 1990s. As part of the alliance's expansion eastward, its membership grew and grew and grew. From 16 at the end of the Cold War, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland joined in 1999. They were followed by another seven states, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia, along with the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, in 2004. Albania and Croatia joined in 2009. And last, but certainly not least, Montenegro in 2017. Now, 29 different member states boast NATO membership. None of this answer is a really basic question. What was the point of moving east, of expanding eastward? And it remains a deeply contentious issue, a matter of debate among scholars and in contemporary politics. To some, the logic of NATO enlargement was straightforward and simple. 
the NATO allies had won the Cold War, and so they could and should expand the alliance eastward if they so wished. Others saw it as a project of democratization, designed to help former Warsaw Pact states manage their political transitions and ensure that ideological norms of democracy and plurality took hold. From the perspective of many in Russia, eastward expansion signaled a reality that was, at best, unpalatable. Now, this did not mean that there was not cooperation between NATO and Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Russia participated in the Partnership for Peace program, the program designed to build trust and mutual confidence between NATO and its former Cold War adversaries. And they signed a blueprint, blueprint excuse me, for future cooperation at NATO's Paris Summit in 1997. Developments over the last five years, however, have soured Russian relations with NATO considerably, not least the Russian annexation of Crimea in February 2014 and the subsequent invasion of Ukraine that August. We hear now pretty commonly about a new Cold War or a second Cold War, or maybe it's the second second Cold War, since there's some debate about how many Cold Wars happened in the first one. Vladimir Putin, of course, frequently denounces NATO's expansion eastward arguing that this expansion is a violation of a promise made to Mikhail Gorbachev as the Soviet Union unraveled, that NATO would not expand eastward. And I don't think it's difficult for us to imagine that from the perspective of Putin and his colleagues in the Kremlin sitting in Moscow, NATO's continued existence, its current posture in Eastern Europe, and its new enlarged membership appears targeted directly at Russia and Russian interests. NATO's military exercise, Trident Juncture, which took place in Norway in October of last year, was the alliance's largest in recent history, with some 50,000 participants. And it took place not that far from the Russian border. And then, of course, there is the enhanced forward presence of forces throughout the Baltic states. But all of this leaves me with one question that I'm still not sure I can answer. Is Russia actually a major threat to transatlantic interests and European security? And I think in our contemporary political landscape, many of our political leaders, policymakers, have elided this decision, pushed off, hoping that if they ignore it, it will miraculously go away. We hear a lot more about the threat of a rising China or of North Korea as a rogue state than we do about Russia. But in policies on the ground, NATO still acts and behaves in a way that it believes that Russia is a threat. So how do we, not unlike Matthias's framing of Brexit, how do we reconcile then this tension between rhetoric, the problems we talk about in our foreign policy, and action, the things that we spend our money and do on the ground, which also send a message to our potential adversaries and friends alike. Now, Relations with Russia are not the only place where the Atlantic Alliance's current purpose and mandate remain fuzzy, maybe we could say. Of all the alliance's missions since the end of the Cold War, NATO's ongoing involvement in Afghanistan has been a major area of engagement. Not only is it the first and only invocation of Article 5 in the alliance's history, but it has also been a long-term mission, spanning nearly 20 years at this point. And recently, with an eye to the Alliance's upcoming 70th birthday, the chief of the German Navy offered a pointed reminder. The A in NATO doesn't stand for Afghanistan, but for Atlantic. <laughs> now, part of dealing with crises is natural in an alliance that has 29 members and ostensibly functions around a principle of consensus. But I think that this broader question of what NATO's purpose is, what role, what it offers to its various member states, be it the government in the United States, the government in Berlin, or any of the other 27 members, is a fundamentally unresolved question that lays at the heart of a lot of the current crisis we see today. Figuring out what, if any, purpose NATO serves seems to me to be the most pressing issue in transatlantic relations, especially if one would like to sell the alliance's continued importance and the need for defense spending to their voters. Thanks so much. Let's move to the podium, please. Yep. What's that? 
it here. Right, thank you very much indeed. I think we are all well informed now about the German uh, perspective, about the British Brexit perspective, and also about NATO, Russia, and the United States all in one go. Uh, what uh, uh, I noticed is when Stefan said that the expansion of NATO was absolutely necessary, otherwise it would have led to uh, maybe the, the disintegration of NATO or, and, or the disintegration of the European Union. At the same time, we also discussed that NATO expansion has led to that trouble with Russia. Without NATO expansion, Russia and the West would still be great friends. What do you think? Is that correct? Let's start with Stefan. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think indeed uh, that um, NATO's um, expansion was, was crucial back in the 1990s uh, for, for, a couple, for a couple of reasons. And, and, and also to, to get back to uh, Susie's uh, point, what is, what, is, what is the main purpose of, of, of NATO today? And, and, and I think most important, NATO is about values, about uh, democratic values, liberal values, and, and, and these values are very much in, in, in jeopardy uh, today. Uh, like it's not only in, in, in Eastern Europe. Look at look at look at the United States. Look at look at Germany. Look at Italy. Uh, we have we have a similar uh, challenge uh, everywhere, and this is also a crucial and much uh, sometimes overlooked um, purpose of, of NATO to uh, to maintain these these values and to uh, like it's not it's not always the challenge is of course Russia, but the challenge I would say is also a challenge from from within. And in Germany, for instance, we have a, have a huge challenge. Um, I saw the numbers recently. Uh, back in the late 1990s, uh, the size of the German Bundeswehr was about 340,000 soldiers. We are allowed under the treaties of 1990 uh, to have a maximum of 380,000. Today, the size of the Bundeswehr is 160,000. So we cut the Bundeswehr by, by half within 20 years. And back 20 years ago, uh, we had 135,000 conscripts. It was a conscript army. And, and, and basically, the, the reforms of, 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 of Gutenberg, of our, foreign, uh, form, of our former uh, uh, foreign, uh, defense minister, have wrecked the Bundeswehr. It, it's no longer in, in, in good shape. We, have, we do not longer participate in, in NATO's missions. We do not even participate in NATO's uh, AVEX missions. In the 90s, we used to participate in the Bosnian War. Uh, that's all a challenge from within. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge from... But, but why would the expansion of NATO have endangered the European Union if that hadn't occurred? I don't understand that. Because, because it's all about hard security. I mean, uh, the, the, the countries of, of Eastern Europe were, were looking for hard security, and the European Union would not have been able to, to give them that kind of hard security. They were very much... Uh, uh, afraid of uh, a research in Russia again. If you think about the 1991 coup against Gorbachev, and uh, back at that time the uh, Soviet forces had just been moving out of, of Hungary, which was a very critical stage. So they were looking for hard security, and they could only get that in, in NATO. Now. So NATO saved the European Union. Do you agree yeah. with that? Yeah. It's a chicken and the egg question, right? Because if the search is for hard security, Part of the reason that the European Union has not, it's not the only reason, but part of the reason that it hasn't been able to develop its own hard security, common foreign and defense policy infrastructure is because the Department of Defense doesn't want it to. And the Department of Defense has waged a decades long war against an independent European security arm. Uh, and so if we look at the way the Bush administration, the first Bush administration conceived of keeping NATO once the Berlin Wall had come down, and once increasingly over the course of 1990 and 1991, it seemed that the Soviet Union was going to collapse as well. One of the biggest issues animating the foreign policy staff who worked on NATO was the prospect that France and Germany in cahoots with one another would build an independent European force. And that this would dislodge the Americans from the European continent and then Bush's team feared that it would be back to the old patterns of the past, that without the Americans there to make sure the Europeans didn't start a war, they might start yet another war, and it would be like World War I and World War II, 
And it would be incredibly expensive for the Americans and the Canadians to go back to recross and rebridge the Atlantic, whereas they could just keep NATO and stay and remain a European power. So I think here actually comes to another place where we get this tension between what was sold publicly about NATO expansion and the purpose of NATO and what if we trace the actual policies on the ground and what it added up to, the debates they had behind the scenes, the policies they pursued, there is a disconnect there between what NATO enlargement was sold as and what NATO enlargement, at least from the perspective of the White House, was intended to do in the early days. Thank you. Matthias. Yeah, I mean, I would uh, tend to kind of dive into that point. It's always interesting for a historian to think of the alternatives, like what would have happened had it not been for, you know, um, on that point, what would have happened to the European Union, which was then not the European Union, still, of course, was still uh, in the making as a European Union. Maybe a kind of dissolution of NATO, maybe a kind of, sort of retreat of NATO would actually have led to a more independent, more self-sufficient European Union, a sort of not the classic economic giant political military dwarf, but a sort of more autonomous power. Of course, that probably wasn't wanted by many players, including by many players within the European Union itself. But it is an, an interesting question. And it also raises the question, what is NATO there in the first place? You know, originally, I can see, you know, values and all that. Uh, but originally, it's, it's a defense. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a defense community, it's against an enemy. That enemy had disappeared in, in 1990, so NATO was on, on the search for a new enemy, or otherwise would have lost its, its reason to be. So luckily, so many enemies were found. In <laughs> <laughs> so has Putin got a point that the expansion of NATO is threatening to Russia, and that Russia needs to defend itself, or is that just an excuse for aggressive behavior? Mm -hmm. He, I think, um, um, NATO did a lot. NATO um, back in the nineteen nineties, NATO um, did a lot also to include Russia. Like, if you think of the Partnership for Peace um, uh, and, and uh, efforts to, to to integrate Russia into a, a, a wider zone of Euro Atlantic security, so it was always a gradual approach. Also, uh, expand NATO gradually, slowly. Imagine if took nine years from the, or ten years from the fall of the Berlin Wall until the uh, exception of the first uh, candidates. It was a long, drawn-out process uh, over, over a decade. And, and, and Russia benefited uh, economically. I mean, there was uh, Gorbachev asked for, for, for economic help, and Yeltsin did the same, and they got that, right? And they were never, like, legally binding written assurances not to, not to uh, expand uh, uh, NATO back at, back at that time. Uh, the Soviets and, and later the Russians were, were out for economic uh, benefits for, for Western financial assistance. They got that, and um, and we recently had had a had a workshop at size on uh, on NATO's enlargement. And and, and Andrei Kozirev was there, the former Russian foreign minister, and he he complained about um, the lack of of like Western uh, consultations when it came to the to the bombings uh, in, uh, uh, in in Serbia in 1999. Uh, that there was no no like, like there should have been more of a of a of a of a, of a prior consultation. But these are I think uh, very minor points. In a nutshell, the, the West pursued a pursued a, a great deal of of, of energy uh, to include uh, the Russians. Also, if you think the special relationship between Clinton and Yeltsin, and and so Putin doesn't have a point. Putin doesn't have a point. Do you agree? No, not really. I I I don't think that. Without NATO enlargement, Putin would not pursue certain types of policies that are perceived to be threatening. That is not the, I don't want to draw a linear, you know, A leads to B and NATO enlargement is the reason Putin is a problem. But that being said, I think that NATO enlargement in its current form gives Putin ammunition for the kinds of policies and agendas he would like to pursue. And it is not a difficult leap for Putin to sell to the Russian people who are anxious and concerned about their position in the world and feeling a sense of loss for what once was a superpower, that now all of these former pieces that used to be part of the Soviet Union, right, used to be part of one country that many Russians, now Russians, grew up learning about in school, are now in NATO, trying to join NATO, and it's it's not difficult, I don't think, for Putin to spin that 
from a public relations standpoint to say, look, you know, if you look at the map, they have moved closer to us and it is encircling us. Um, now, Putin is shrewd in using that to his own advantage to help his position at home. Uh, but I think that any realistic assessment of the current tensions in NATO-Russian relations has to appreciate that at least it, that is there for Putin to manipulate as he wishes. And, and NATO should be aware of that. It shouldn't change NATO's policies, but be aware that you may sour relations with the Russians down the road. Thank you very much. Matthias, how can the Putin problem be overcome? Time. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's hard. I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure if it's necessarily a Putin problem or more a sort of um, geostrategic problem in a sense of, of post Cold War Europe. You know, where is the new center? Where is the power? Where does the European Union stand in a sort of triangular almost relationship? But I think Putin is, of course, a very skillful politician, a very shrewd sort of manipulator as well. So it's very hard to pin stuff on Putin as a kind of figurehead. Mm -hmm. But I think the sort of the bigger structural uh, problems, the, the, the Russian feeling of insecurity has been something we've had for <coughs> centuries, um, particularly as regards the um, its uh, western border, um, the uh, economic trade interlinkages between East Western Europe and now with, with um, Russia is something we've also had during the Cold War, before the Cold War, the American suspicions about that is also something we've had for a very long time. So Putin, in a sense, crystallizes, maybe accelerates mm -hmm. some of these the dynamics. So I think the deeper, underlying, non-resolved kind of strategic questions. Thank you. Know. Well, we may have a Putin problem, maybe not, or <laughs> geo geostrategic problem. We have a Brexit problem, certainly. <laughs> and we also seem to have a German problem, because the Germans are not rearming as much as they should. Under Schmidt, uh, there were, or under Carter, there was an agreement and the Europeans all promised they would rearm up to 3% of their GDP and that was actually accepted by all Western European countries. Now it's 2% and they can't even get to 2%. You just told us the Germans get to 1.25 uh, and a bit. Why is that? Why do they not see reason and really uh, put much more money into their arms? <laughs> Good questions. <laughs> uh, I think um, we live in a dream world <laughs> in Germany. So, some, 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 some people do live in a dream world, uh, not acknowledging uh, the changing circumstances, not acknowledging Russia's aggressiveness, not acknowledging uh, the erosion of the liberal order. But the former, let me interrupt, the former foreign minister, the German foreign minister, Sigmar Gabriel, said if the Germans did rearm by 2% or even 3% over many years, the West wouldn't like it either. Is that something <laughs> like that? It's an old problem. Is yeah. that old problem still there or not? Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. The problem is, is still there. So we can, we can, we can only like, like rearm or, 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 or invest more um, in conjunction with others. It has to be a multilateral approach within NATO. Um, uh, and, and Helmut Schmidt used to, used to say, no singularization. Germany must not be singularized, right? We must never be alone in this, in this effort. Also in the Euro missile crisis, we, we, we cannot deploy new missiles just on, 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 on German territory. The others have to deploy as well, because we, we, we don't want to be the rearmers and we don't want to be the primary threat within the Western Russia. So, yeah, still, still there. Okay, you welcome. Yeah, but it's of course also a very nice excuse for Gabriel, right? <laughs> to, to say, yeah. oh, you know, people wouldn't want that. You know, the, the Germans are there to feed you at your throat, as Churchill used to say. Um, but it's also uh, a fact that defense spending is immensely unpopular in Germany. Yeah. It's it's as a kind of the best, it's, it's a non-starter domestically. Whereas in some countries in Britain and the US probably as well, you can make quite a good case for you know strong defense, you know, keeping you know our border safe, etc. etc. In Germany the discourse is different, partly for reasons of the past, but also because of the political culture that's now there. So it's it's a tough sell domestically and you're gonna make yourself incredibly unpopular if if, if you if you sell this. Especially if it's seen to come, you know, to be, if Germany is seen to be bullied into that spending by some party or another. We all know that uh, President Trump is most unhappy with uh, 
that the Europeans don't get to 2%. Let's, let's assume for a minute they all got to 2%. Would that resolve the crisis between uh, Trump and Europe, or are there more structural problems apart from the actual 2% ceiling uh, at play? Is there something which has changed in transatlantic relations that the closeness, the cultural, political, security closeness has really been undermined? Never mind 2% or 3% or 1.5%. Is there something beyond that actual figure? Susie? I mean, the figure is always the, the place of um, focus, and it has been, I mean, this goes back to Carter and Carter's push in the 1970s. The Canadian argument against the figure was always that quality was what mattered, and that percentages were useless. It's the argument Pierre Trudeau's government made in 1978. It's the argument Justin Trudeau's government makes now with reference to the fact that Canada is leading one of the enhanced forward presence deployments. It's a pretty outsized role for the Canadian military to play, given that it's usually all but forgotten in transatlantic relations. But I think that the Trump factor, it, it's difficult because some things are obviously, have, have a clear continuity. This obsession with burden sharing and the percentage paid goes back to Eisenhower. And this is as old as NATO itself. But, but then there's this sort of wild card about what Donald Trump actually wants when he complains about the percentage. And I have a hard time personally being convinced that the numbers are what matter to him. I think he has, it seems to me from what he said on the campaign trail and since being in office, that he just has a broader sense that NATO is a bad deal and that the US is footing the bill and that all the other ways that the allies contribute, like the fact that they provide territory for the US military, like AFRICOM is still based in Stuttgart, of all places yeah. uh, for the African command to be based. But, but those erosions of sovereignty, that, that kind of burden sharing doesn't appeal to Trump's sensibilities. And so Trump is sort of focused on this idea that NATO is a bum deal and the Americans are being taken to the cleaners. Thank you. It does raise the question again, what was NATO there in the first place? And do these reasons still exist? I mean, which you put it in. For the Europeans, um, it, it might be a very bad wake up call, um, once kind of the US has been shifting its attention towards specific for quite some decades uh, now, uh, Europe, Europe is getting smaller while the world is, is getting bigger, bigger. it's getting more popular, etc, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, so so I, I can see that Trump in a sense has a point with the free rider arguments about the Europeans in, in security. Um, whether the solution is to kind of prop up NATO spending, defense spending, or to come up with some new kind of European framework in response to these challenges is, of course, a different question. Hmm. Uh, I would agree. I would say that there are structural problems because uh, the uh, Clinton and Bush and Obama administrations ha have made this point time and again because we, we Germans, we have a, yeah, like a free ride in, 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 in NATO and we, we used to be one of the strongest uh, contributors uh, there. And I think there should also be more... Um, more exchange and more more transatlantic exchange, uh, trying to explain one another's policy. Why why, why the German policymakers uh, do not come to the United States more more often and, and, and trying to explain their policies? Uh, I, I went to a uh, talk by by NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg at the Enterprise uh, at the at the American Heritage at the Heritage Foundation. So it, he had a tough time there <laughs> because uh, it's it, it's worlds apart. But but he but nevertheless he tried to explain his his, his policy and I would I would I would like to see more of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But transatlantic relations is a lot more than just security and NATO. There's um, the cultural relationship, of course, intelligent relationship, and of course the trade and economic relationship. When you look at all these areas, despite the so-called trade war and the negotiations which are going on between the European the European Commission and uh, Trump. In all other aspects, I believe, at least at the working level, things are working more or less fine. So are we just being, or is Trump distorting the actual picture of transatlantic relations? So do we think there is a crisis because of Donald Trump's tweets, but in reality there actually is no crisis? I'll take it. Uh, I'm teaching a class right now at Yale that I called NATO in crisis 1949 to 2019. 
And so in the first uh, seminar with my students, I asked them, they're largely Americans, uh, why we need NATO. If they think we need NATO, overwhelmingly yes, they all said consensus, just like NATO would want. Consensus, yes, we need it. Then I said, why? How would you tell your next door neighbor before the next election why we need NATO? They have no answer. And that to me is the crisis that Donald Trump, so Trump is maybe a, a symptom or, and he's bombastic and flourish and all of these things that grab headlines, but Trump has sort of inadvertently revealed a question that I think no one answered, which is why do we need NATO? In a first principles explanation, why does the transatlantic relationship beyond NATO matter? Why is free trade important? Why is it long been seen as a cornerstone of the West or of the so-called liberal international order or rules-based international order or whatever slogan of the day you'd like to use? And to me, as, as long as we have no real answer for that, that is a source of crisis, whether Trump says or tweets whatever. Matthias. I think it kind of links back to the end of the Cold War that now suddenly the West is everywhere, right? We don't have exactly the end of history, but it's uh, we're going to defend the liberal trading order, you know, no longer looking at Europe necessarily. You might as well look at China, you might as well look at Japan, you might look at, you know, South America. And so so it's, it's now increasingly global Pax Americana, as it were. Um, so the foundation of the transatlantic alliance as it was created in the 40s and 50s that has now expanded uh, immensely. So the Europeans are no longer in the kind of privileged position of being America's only champion or ally in that, in, in those bigger. I would also say is the, uh, your point was uh, very interesting, uh, uh, referring to your the students in your class. I would say it's also a generational thing. Maybe we have the Generation X now. We have the millennials uh, growing up uh, after the Cold War not uh, remembering uh, what, what it means to live in a, in a, in a dangerous world. So we, I think we have to, 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 um, to, to educate the younger generation more, and that is also our task like as, as speakers and scholars. And uh, I think that is also a, a, crucial, a crucial issue. Thank you very much. We have several generations in this room, <laughs> you know, older and younger and millennials as well. So why don't we ask the question, you know, is there a crisis in transatlantic relations or is Donald Trump just making it up? A question over there I saw at the, uh, someone raised his or her hand, I can't see, right at the right, end. Right behind right. the camera. Yeah. Yeah. I must say I'm jealous. I wish I lived in a country where people were resistant to the idea of military spending. I wish we could get down to 2% of the GDP. Of GDP. Um, it seems to me that this has been a very interesting discussion, but the security threat I've seen in the future is the climate, is the environment. And all the talk about Russia and Putin, what he's doing, doesn't seem to really be open to the fact that you know, we'll face a different order of magnitude of problems that these, these concerns are only address. Could you understand the question? Yeah. 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 And I, I would very much agree that uh, these are the real challenges <laughs> challenges of today. But there's a saying that generals always like to, like to fight the last war, right? Uh, it, it, there, there might be the, the danger of that with, with NATO now. Um, is NATO the right forum necessarily to fight climate change? Probably not. Probably needs some, some kind of other global forum or something. But maybe attention should be steered much more to these new threats ra rather than the old or, or imagined threats. Would be by so I sympathize very much with that point. I mean, in a historical perspective, as a side, an interesting anecdote: NATO did try to deal with climate change, right? That was mm. part of the idea behind the Committee on the Challenges of Modern Society. That Richard Nixon spearheaded as NATO's, yeah, surprisingly, the environmentalist Richard Nixon. Uh, he, he envisioned this, this committee to study the, the challenges of modern society, but many of them were pollution, so water pollution, air pollution kind of studies. Obviously not a role NATO has continued to preserve, but I think that here is again a question of, I, I wonder, and it concerns me a, a lot, about what is Trump's rhetoric, right? So, so what is Trump's bluster about pulling out of Paris? And how deep down into U.S. policy does that actually go? 
right? Is, is it another case where things are on a working level still far more continuous than there's much greater continuity than we believe from the rhetoric? Or is this a place where maybe given the issue, continuity is not getting us very far in terms of actually doing something about climate change? Um, yes, here, please. Uh, Susie raised the question in her talk about whether or not Russia was uh, still a threat. And I would love to hear uh, the panel discuss that question a little bit. I'm puzzled. Um, there's the nuclear threat seems to be growing. The annexation and threats to the adjoining country seems to be great. On the other hand, uh, we are still believe that Russia doesn't have the economic wherewithal to be a real player on the world stage. So, uh, Susie, is Russia, answer your own question, <laughs> is Russia really a threat? I think there are obvious ways where Russia remains a threat and, and we need to stay attuned to those, right? I mean, as long as Russia is a nuclear power, there is a threat there. And I think we should be deeply concerned about Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine. I think that's a subject that receives far less attention than it should in our coverage and in understanding how security in Europe will work. Uh, Ukraine is not a piece of Europe we should forget, but rather a place that is central. Uh, Russia's borders with Georgia as another contested area that has been historically problematic. Um, I think there's also another place that Russia is a threat um, that maybe acknowledges a little bit more that Russia's overall power in the international system has declined, but it still remains relevant and important, which is we don't exist in a world of dyads and, and binary pairs, right? So while we all obsess about US-China relations, Russia has a big stake in what that relationship looks like, what kind of world order is formed as a rising China emerges. And Putin is exactly the kind of political player who will try to make the most of that to, for his benefit. I mean, they share a border. It's of considerable concern to Putin what kind of government exists in China and how popular they are and how much sway they have in the international order. So I think we, we should take seriously the fact that Russia is a threat. Uh, I wonder if policymakers at NATO are, or generally across uh, on both sides of the Atlantic are good at articulating where, why, and how Russia is a threat and what we should do about it. Mm -hmm. I would also say, um, yeah, I would also agree that Russia is a, is a, is a tremendous um, uh, threat right now. And, and, and Putin is a, himself, he's also, uh, he plays uh, with his threats and with his assertiveness and with his psychological warfare also trying to provoke and 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 uh, and I think um, there is also a tremendous danger um, from uh, misunderstanding from miscalculation uh, if you think uh, about the uh, Russia's uh, military presence in uh, Kaliningrad for example of their maneuvers the maneuvers are huge they are uh, um, there is uh, no more proper maneuver uh, notification right there is a lot of danger that that some sort of, of, of incidents can lead to a major war and then you have a huge uh, and, and a very quick escalation uh, and, and, and I'm very concerned about that in, in Europe we used to have a, a, a functioning verification systems and on-site verification uh, um, on, on the ground of military facilities and that is all no longer there and the Russians they conduct huge military maneuvers of 300,000 soldiers uh, in, in, in eastern Russia and, and about 150 to 200,000 uh, soldiers in, in, in the western parts of, of, of Russia and nobody's there to 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 to, um, to um, um, and verify it and, to, and and that that concerns me a great deal. Um, I would agree with my other two panelists. Um, although I don't think the main threat is necessarily soldiers, but more the stuff about destabilization that you uh, you also mentioned. I think it um, and of course cyber security. Exactly. Please remember our event next week. <laughs> 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 I just, uh, opened the door for that. Um, yeah, but I think that that is the, the real issue. I mean, Russia likes to destabilize the uh, Western liberal order uh, because it hasn't exactly benefited from it. And Putin benefits from that destabilization. In what form that takes, 
it can be, of course, very different than a NATO or kind of anti-NATO <laughs> maneuver, right? Because it's a lot about intelligence, warfare, propaganda, psychology, etc., etc., etc. Aren't we lucky that Putin and Trump are best friends? <laughs> Simon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Stefan, in one of his responses to an earlier question, commented about the ideological aspect of NATO, about NATO being uh, a forum for liberal democracies, which of course historically has not been universally the case. Uh, we have you know, Greek military dictatorships, Turkish military dictatorships, some sketchy posts in Portugal and also in Spain. But even today with Erdogan in Turkey, it's very hard to make the case that Turkey belongs in a liberal uh, liberal hack. Yeah. My question is not specifically about Turkey, but rather an issue that I was surprised that none of the panelists talked about, which is the rise of nationalism in general in Europe uh, at this period. And I wonder if uh, the three of you see this as being having being just a question of correlation, or actually being a question of causation in the strains that we see on NATO coming not just from the United States, but from countries like Hungary, Poland, and India. So is the rise of nationalism the cause of the crisis in transatlantic relations, or is it the other way around? Good one. Uh, I would say um, it's probably a, a, a major cause for, for today's crisis. And it, it, um, 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 are, are, we, are we ready to, to defend Turkey? Are we ready to defend Hungary? Are we ready to defend Poland? Um, what about our nationalist uh, tendencies in Germany? We have uh, uh, Die Linke and the Alternative for Deutschland. Uh, it's, it's a combined third of the vote on the political extremes, left and right. And so this is a huge <coughs> issue, and I would say it's, 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 it's a cause. The na there was always a, a, a nationalist element, like uh, since, since since the fall of the Berlin Wall, it was always a resurgence of, of, of nationalism, but, but it, um, it's, it's, its impact is growing, and I would say it's, it's, it's a major cause for, for the current crisis. It's a bit chicken and egg again, isn't it? Um, I think, um, a, as regards more specifically the European integration dimension of this, um, I think a lot of it is caused by the disappointments of kind of failed promises from, you know, EU Eastern enlargement, NATO enlargement and so on. And the bigger structural issue is it's not kind of one size fits all thing. I mean, if, if you look at the European community in, as it was founded in 57, 58, it was six member states with very kind of clearly defined, you know, competences and, and other stuff. Um, this expanded. We now have, as of now 28 still i think it is i haven't checked my phone in the last hour but um, so it's so, something like 28 member states but we still have essentially the same mechanisms rule make, rate making mechanisms the same institutions that deal with that it's not really capable of making decisions right now that leads to disappointment um it's also that a lot of the attractions of the european union don't pay off equally well for all member states so it's it's, it's a sense of kind of projecting Cold War institutions into the post Cold War era. I'm thinking with the European Union, a, a bit of that kind of anti European uprise we're seeing now, and we probably see play out in European Parliament elections in, in, in May, is, is, is some sort of, of expression of that, and it accelerates it in turn. I mean, if you look at referenda, for example, it's quite interesting at all referenda about treaties and membership and so on were essentially all except for Norway positive till the late 80s early 90s and then with Maastricht and the expansion of competences for the European Union they, they slowly but surely turned to a more negative practice being kind of the, the combination and there's also a sense of kind of not imperial overstretch but of some sort of overstretch. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes please. The lady here. The lady here. Hi, thank you so much. It's been really great. I've learned a lot. Um, I will be the first to say that, that I'm easily overwhelmed by these kinds of conversations. Um, one of the reasons I guess I subscribe to um, Louisa's Naomi's view that there's this dysfunction of power and fragmentation of power centers, and that that creates a lot of tension and friction. So I, I guess when I think about this topic, for me, NATO is military. So 
we have the military sphere, and we have to also balance this between the community and the military. There's the economic sphere. There's the political sphere. I would add two more. I would get the world back. There's the development sphere. And there's also the social sphere. I think it's, I don't know what to call it, social media, rise of nationalism. There's another sphere out there. Is part of the issue that those spheres are not very well aligned and potentially in tension with each other? I mean, who has the vision? Where's the leadership that's aligning the military needs to the economic needs to making sure development efforts are dealing with climate change and refugee flows and some of those tensions? I mean, like I said, I get easily overwhelmed, so I don't know how to ask the question. Is, yeah, maybe I briefly uh, repeat it for because the microphone wasn't too strong. Uh, the lady says there are many spheres, not just the military sphere, but also the political, the uh, environmental, the development uh, sphere, the cultural sphere. And isn't the problem, she asks, or she wonders, uh, that these spheres are not aligned, but overlap kind of incoherently, and that we need a more visionary leadership, which brings it all into a coherent, uh, holistic whole, if I understood you correctly. Is that the problem? I would say absolutely, but I'm not sure if transatlantic relations are the right forum for that, because a lot of these problems are global, right? And, and it, it brings back to the question, what is actually the transatlantic relationship? What, has, what holds it together? Where does it come from? Is it values? I mean, and essentially, transatlantic relationship is a creation of the late 40s, because we need some legitimization for continuous military presence in, in Western Europe, right? And then all the other layers kind of added, added up to that. So I think for kind of addressing the real kind of global issues, it might be good to kind of zoom back from those kind of we we'll zoom out from these kind of transatlantic frameworks and look more at kind of more global power centers, whichever form they are. I mean, even if you look at you know, the G20, you know, back to the G7 had what was it, five West European members and the US and Canada. But you know, when, when I listen, if I'm interrupt, if, uh, if, when I listen to the discussion here, then most of you believe, I think, that the transatlantic relationship is a military relationship, or that the dimension of the military relationship is really making up a, the core of transatlantic relations. To me personally, I actually think economic relations and political relations make up the transatlantic relationship more importantly than the military one. When you think of trade relations, the most important trade relations and economic relations in the world are still between America and Europe. They're not between America and China or Europe and China. It still is a transatlantic relationship on both sides of the Atlantic. And that, for, for me, is one rationale why we have still good, flourishing, relatively uh, transatlantic relations because of that monetary factor, if you like, so human greed, people want to make a business and a profit, and that drives it forward, not just NATO. How would you see that? Uh, I would completely agree. It's uh, Numbers are amazing. It's about, I think, five, five trillion dollars yep. a year, and then 16, 16 million jobs are directly dependent from transatlantic trade, enormous. It used to be over 50% of world trade, which world now trade. has gone yeah. down from yeah. beneath around yeah. 40%, but it's still pretty high. Yeah, it's, it's, it's still there, and, and also we, um, yeah, I mean, the transatlantic um, uh, alliance was always, if, if you think about the 70s and 80s, it, it, it was always um, a, a room also for new ideas and for economic cooperation. If you think, you mentioned it, Matthias, the establishment of the, uh, of the G7, the World Economic uh, Summits, and it was a was a very f um, uh, forward-looking uh, approach to build robust institutions. It's it's all about institutions that that um, that are there. Like you, you may have crisis between leaders, <laughs> which we now have, but the institutions are still there. NATO is still there. The G7 is still there. The European Union is still there. So so these institutions were were designed to to to, um, to overcome leadership. Crisis, and that was the was the purpose. Uh, one of one, one of uh, one former foreign service officer from from the State Department, James Woodby, I mentioned him before. He used the term diplomatic cathedral building. You have to build institutions uh, with the durability of cathedrals, like for not for decades but for centuries uh, to outlive uh, the crisis in between. And I think uh, trade is also such a such a diplomatic. <laughs> 
cathedral. Maybe it's the best cathedral, and we 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 should pay more attention to that. Thank you, Susie. I think that uh, I would. I mean, in my own understanding of NATO and my own work on NATO, I think of NATO as much more. Uh, it's political. It's military. It also has some economic dimensions. It's not the only uh, component of transatlantic relations, though. At least with respect to Russia, as I talked about today, I think it is still the largest uh, institutional figure in that landscape. But it, I really do think that uh, NATO is a political alliance. I mean, NATO's self-description is as a political and military alliance. And we tend to forget, especially on this side of the Atlantic, that political dimension. Um, but I want to bridge these two questions about senses and spheres and nationalism to talk about something that we have sort of uh, skirted around but haven't dealt with which is emotional and um, psychological, the mood of the day. And I think that not for the first time in transatlantic relations, it is this mood that is really shaping a sense of crisis. So we worry about the failure of liberal values to take hold in Hungary, in Poland, in Turkey. Uh, we worry about the credibility of the United States and whether the United States is still the leader of the free world, right? Take after Donald Trump's election, we saw a whole host of pieces declaring that Angela Merkel was now the leader of the free world because, well, it sure as heck looked like Trump wasn't. So somebody had to step in and, and she's pretty darn good, right? And so you also have just a general sense of declinism, that the old order is falling apart, that all of these institutions, that maybe your cathedral is now missing a roof, right? right? That the liberal international order is neither liberal nor international nor an order. <laughs> um, and so I think that this, this emotional sense of crisis, this psychological sense of crisis, is actually something that really brings together all of these spheres and issues um, and, and is not always in step with what is actually happening in day-to-day -day life, but rather that the broad mood of the time is sort of an anxious and ne negative one about these institutions. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. I would agree very much, of course, that the transatlantic relationship is, is in those regards coming straight very solid. You know, if you have hourly flights between New York and London, of course, it shows you a very sort of stable thing. But it's also a question of who profits from this and, you know, who are the winners and losers. And I think what we also now have is globalization and kind of the uh, liberal, global, free trade, etc. And, you know, increasingly the, the Boundaries are not, not so much nation states, but rather those elements in those societies who profit from that and not. And if you look at Brexit, if you look at Trump, if you look at sort of the analyses of these sort of elections, one line of interpretation has been it's, you know, the people left behind from the profits and benefits of those great, um, you know, trade networks and so on are the ones who kind of voice their, their outrage and, and this discontent. So maybe the uh, the, the nation borders are no longer as relevant to these questions, but rather the societal economic okay. boundaries. Thanks very much. We have got time for one or two, maybe three questions. Yeah. Trump is undoubtedly wrong on the environment and climate change, but on the NATO payments issue, he's touching on something that is critical at the end of the First World War, the United States stopped the Earth that got off, and the critical point was that it abandoned, refused to ratify the treaty to defer, to deter Germany. As a result, American soldiers are buried by the, in the tens of thousands in France who had to storm the beaches instead of getting off a troop ship, as they would have if we'd stuck, this country had stuck to its policy. The country learned the hard way that deterrence has to be implemented and did so after World War I by Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, NATO, etc. There is the possibility, and this is where the 2% or whatever the percent issue is critical, that the American public will repeat what it did back in 1920. 
stop the earth and get off. If the Europeans won't defend themselves, tough. Why should we? One ought not to ignore that all during that period when we had given up the policy of deterrence, the trade and economic relations that you were talking about continued. Mm -hmm. The critical issue in the transatlantic relationship is whether or not the people of this country will continue to support a kind of deterrence policy. And if they don't, there are going to be some real difficulties. Thank you very much. Do you see a new isolationism in this country? Your closest to your <laughs> <laughs> I'm For me, the, the, this is really the crux of the issue, right? Because the biggest problem is that if you want to sustain a commitment like the Transatlantic Partnership in its current form or any other, you need to be able to sell why it is worth paying the price, right? Successive generations of American presidents have come down in favor of the argument that it is worth the price to first deter the Soviet Union, to uh, ensure that the United States has a voice in the future of Europe, that they're not pushed out by the process of European integration uh, in more uh, contemporary iterations to spread liberal values or to fight a war on terror, and, and that it is better to have allies than to go it alone. The problem we see now is that in, in the debates that have arisen with Donald Trump's candidacy and then his election to the presidency, uh, we see people willing to challenge the view that the president puts forward, but many of them appeal to the ties of the past, not the future, right? It is, this is what we have done, and so we should stay. Uh, and that inertia is not necessarily what's going to change voters' minds, that it is worth continuing to put money into NATO. And so I think that anyone who believes in the transatlantic relationship and believes in NATO in particular, the military dimensions of that relationship, the deterrence uh, aspects of that relationship, you've got to get a better sales pitch, right? You've got to say, this is what NATO gives us, right? This is why the money is worth it. And that's a problem that's only going to become more acute as economic Construction happens. Thank you very much. I think it would be a good job for yourself. <laughs> well, I'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a question here. But... The, uh, yeah, somebody mentioned money. Uh, the United States has spent the most money on military. There's a microphone here. Yeah? The United States. Uh, yeah. The United States spends the most uh, on military. Forces in the world, seven hundred billion dollars, more than what the next six or ten largest budgets in the world, and that, to me that raises a lot of questions, uh, like uh, what does this mean with regard to the United States relationship to the rest of the people uh, nations that are spending this money, and what does this say about? the other nations that are willing to let the United States be this hegemon with regard to military expenditure. Uh, I, I understand Gerhardt's comments about uh, isolationism, okay, uh, but uh, you know, do we really want the United States to be the policeman of the world? Uh, as it currently seems to be, Trump may be withdrawing from it a little bit, uh, I agree with uh, Professor Coburn with regard to Trump's view on NATO. Uh, he just doesn't like multilateral organizations. NATO, the European Union, United Nations. Uh, but money-wise, is it sustainable for the United States to continue to be the predominant spender of Military monies. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, let me ask, before I ask you to answer that, is there one final question? Because then I would like uh, to ask you a final question, and perhaps you can then also uh, reply here to our last question from the audience. Um, tell me about the future of transatlantic relations. Will NATO continue to exist? Will it disintegrate? Will the European Union continue to exist beyond Brexit? Or what is your speculative but well-informed consideration? Matthias. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Will the European Union continue to exist after Brexit? Yes. Otherwise, Brexit couldn't take place, right? Because it needs to exit something. Um, uh, for how long is a different question, but um, historians are always very bad prophets, so it's, it's hard to say. Um, Give it a try. It, it will change its face, probably beyond recognition, but it won't kind of dissolve altogether. I, I can't really see that happening, but then other people have not seen other things happening. So I think it's, there's, a, there's a lot of uncertainty on that. About the question whether defense spending is, is sustainable, nobody, from a European perspective, nobody forces the US to spend that money. It does so out of its enlightened self-interest. Um, that is a question for political leadership, essentially, to decide. And now we have, for the first time, uh, for the first time in a long term, a president who doesn't see that self as self-evident, apparently, or rather to spend it for other means than, um, than NATO. The Soviet Union has had some bad experiences with overspending on military. Um, the US, not so much. Um, I think a lot of people profit from it, so I wouldn't mm -hmm. gamble on it going away. Right? Um, but yeah, but it's, it's healthy for the international system to have that kind of military hegemon, as it were, it's hard to say also. Yeah. So you're optimistic regarding the future of the EU and the future of NATO? I'm not, opt I'm optimistic in the sense that it will continue to exist. Okay. But <laughs> in what form or shape is, 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 uh, is, is, a, is a different question. It depends on so many variables now that it's very hard to see this further than three, six months' time. Okay, Susie, are you equally optimistic? I don't see either disappearing from the landscape in the near future. I also don't think that that means any of the problems that they are dealing with now suddenly evaporate overnight. So I think that a lot of the issues, I mean, Brexit is not going to change, it may change Britain's relationship with the European Union, but it's not going to change the way other European states feel about the problems facing it institutionally. And the same is true of NATO. Uh, regardless of what moves the president makes on Twitter or in any other venue. Um, I, I think this question of how much burden the United States is willing to carry um, in defense is both a question of transatlantic relations and not, and this is a source of chronic tension in the transatlantic relationship, but a huge part of the U.S. military expenditure is not about the defense of Europe or NATO or anything like this. It's about the war in Afghanistan, about uh, operations that are conducted in over 100 countries uh, in the world at any given time. And so uh, that global reach, uh, the, the refrain policymakers in Washington used during the Cold War in a sort of disparaging tone to their allies was that the United States was a global power and everybody else was a regional power. Uh, in NATO, and so uh, the United States spent more because it mattered more, because its power projection was global. But the the question of how sustainable that is, is also not new. I mean, Dwight Eisenhower, so it's his long-standing concern, was president in the 50s. This was, he looked for ways in the short term to try to reduce U.S., how much U.S., the U.S. commitment to Europe cost through things like massive retaliation as a strategy. But warned about, you know, he never envisioned that U.S. troops would still be in Europe this long after World War II. And so I think that this there is a, a political need in this country to have a sort of first principles debate about what, what we are spending money on, whether it is worth it, uh, and whether this is something that taxpayers want to sustain. And they, of course, have domestic trade-offs, too, right? There are things that are not funded because you spend money on defense. That's just a reality of life. Let's have a referendum. Let's not do that. <laughs> I don't vote for that course of action. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not <laughs> serious. I'm not serious. <laughs> proposing. I think you get the wrong answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I bet everybody in this room that NATO and the European Union will be still there in 10 years. 
But boy, we will have a tough time if Trump gets reelected. And that will be really, really tough. So we will have a, a, a rough, a couple of rough years ahead. And he has a good chance. I say he has a good chance to get reelected. Uh, and that, that, that's my. Does, that's, does that that's, mean you're an optimist or a pessimist? I'm, 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 an, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm an optimist who worries. <laughs> the final word to Matthias. I mean, if you, if you kind of zoom out and look at the bigger picture, why are these institutions there? You know, if, if the reasons for them being there have not gone away, the institutions probably won't go away either. And mm. European Union is essentially kind of Europe's self-assertion or survival in an increasingly non-European world. And that structural pressure will not go away. What the raison let's say for NATO is, is, uh, yeah. is something we've discussed in the past. Yeah, now. I also think we are easily misled by the drama of the day, be it Trump, the crisis in NATO or other uh, conflict areas. You know, within a, two, a few years, these dramas, which we think are really almost life-threatening, may look very, very differently and less dramatic than they do right now. So I guess maybe in two years' time, or even at the end of another four years' time, NATO and the European Union, and even the transatlantic relationship may still be here. Thank you very much indeed for coming to join us. Thank you.